Okay, today we are going to go on um, to Kohlberg. Um, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen now. Um, these courses, are, when I, during, I, you're not supposed to date these tapes, but I'm going to do it. These courses are taped Monday and Wednesday morning in, this, in the semester that I'm taping them. Um, this one is being taped on a Wednesday, and next Wednesday is a Jewish Holy Day, and I will not be here. Um, uh, uh, so, however far I get with Kohlberg, I know it may be out of order on the syllabus that some of you have, uh, no matter what semester it is, but we're going to do Kohlberg and then Maslow. Uh, I, I may not finish Kohlberg by then, so just leave a big space at the end of your notes. Uh, and uh, a person who this semester is uh, my doctoral assistant, uh, Lee Sterling, will be doing the presentations on humanism. Um, but probably the last time this tape airs, he'll already be Dr. Sterling, and then he'll have all the credentials you need because he's pretty close. But um, he knows humanism very, very well, and he also... Um, his area of research interest is creativity, uh, talent development, uh, gifted and talented programs, but he comes from a background that says all children's talent needs to be developed. And he um, has worked a great deal implementing humanistic perspectives and a humanistic look at how to develop children's talents across the board. He knows humanism very well, has a lot of good practical examples, so he'll be doing that. Um, just as at the beginning you saw that Francis um, who did the early tapes, uh, knows behaviorism very, very well. Uh, so, um, as I said, one of, the good, one of the things that's very important when you're a teacher, I told you from time to time I'll give you nuggets of wisdom, I haven't done it in the last few weeks, but uh, is to admit when you don't know something or to admit when students think, know something better than you do. There's nothing wrong with that, okay? It's very nice. Um, Often, it used to be, today it's less so, that people would go take a course in computers, right, and how to do computing and this kind of thing, when computers first began to come into the school 15 years ago, 20 years ago, and students would walk into their computing classes who knew much more than they did, okay, because they've been piddling since they were kids. So, uh, you had this generation of teachers who didn't know anything about computers, that is gone now, by, by and large. But so, and the good teachers said, okay, come help me. The bad ones try to push it away, okay? You don't have to be the fount of all knowledge, and it's good to use people. And I said, Lee um, probably knows, certainly from the applied aspects of humanism, knows much, much more than I do, so um, he'll be doing that. But I may not finish Kohlberg by the time it comes, so we may have to take a, uh, a break. We'll do Kohlberg, and then we'll, we'll do uh, Maslow and finish it. By the way, uh, if you really want to be multicultural, I'm going to talk about multiculturalism from a Coburgian perspective. If you really want to be multicultural, there are a lot of cultures hanging around this country, right? And people who are loyal to their particular ethnic or religious subgroup, as I happen to be, right? You have to make some accommodations. Right? This is your first lesson in multiculturalism. We may get some of this stuff out of order. Okay, but let's start talking about Coburg, okay? Uh, and we're going to start like this. We're going to start like this. What I want to do is I want you to write down, those of you who are taking it by television or some other uh, uh, medium other than live, uh, do it now and tell me where do people's morals and values come from? From where do they come? That's better English. How do you get them? How, how do people acquire values and morals? Okay, what's the source of values and morals? How do we get them? Write something down. Those of you taking it on tape or watching streaming or however you're doing it or watching a TV, write it down. Let's see if you come up with something. Okay? All right, who wants to, who wants to tell me something? I'm gonna, let's go to the tablet and see if I can put my picture in the tablet. Who wants to tell me one source of where morals and values come? Go ahead. Parents. Okay, we have parents. Okay? There we go. Parents. Okay. Where else? Go ahead. Schools. School. Gee, I'm glad somebody said it. This is a course in teacher education. <laughs> so I remember the schools. I was going through this had a list of 16 things in those schools. And come on, will ya? Okay, what else? Where else? Put, tell me what you wrote down. Go Churches. ahead. Churches. Church. Church, okay. I'll put religious institutions, right? 
religion, okay? What else? Got another one? Go ahead. Television, media? Media, absolutely. TV, etc. Absolutely. Peers. Peers. Okay, fine. Who else has one? Who wrote something down that's not on here? Culture. Go ahead. Would you, would you, go ahead. Just an innate need to be significant in the world. I'm putting that over here. How, how, what do you mean to be significant? What do you mean by significant? To mean something or to. So how does that have to, what does that have to do with values and morals? It, you get driven to either be good or to do bad. By what? Is something innate? There's just an innate emptiness to do. Okay. Now I got it. Who else? I heard somebody else. Okay, go ahead. What else do you have? Environment. Environment. Okay. Whoops. I can fix this. There we go. Who else? Anybody going to have anything else? Okay, with the exception of this, and we'll get to this, this actually could be the heading for all of these, right? Your parents, your church, your school, your meeting, your peers, those are all things in your environment, right? With the exception of this one, okay, there's always one person who's, who's a wise guy, and I'm glad, who says, wait a minute, maybe it's not all that way. All of you, take a look at this list, right? All of these things are things in your environment. I was waiting for that one. Okay, then, because that's really a summary of all the rest, okay? That's really, if you think about it, okay, it's a learning approach. Come back to me if you can. In other words, you're saying, look, your, you learn these from your peers, your parents, your religious environment, your, the media, etc. all these things that have influence on us, right? Like Ben Dura said, you know, you copy the media, you, you uh, uh, model the media, or you're reinforced for certain things and not for other things. Okay, here's the problem. Kohlberg is a Piagetian. And Kohlberg is, going to Kohlberg is going to make the following. If you maintain that people are like Piaget, that they're not just stamped and molded out by their environment, that they take things in from the environment, that they try to make sense of them, that they're constantly, the word that Piaget didn't use is constructing their own environment, constructing a picture of the world that makes sense to them, and constructing ever better pictures of the world and rejecting older ones to say, nah, it's, I'm rejecting this idea that the car ahead is always going faster. I have a better way to con conceive of space and of, of, of movement through space now. Right? You have to look at the relative movements, and if the relative distance stays the same, then they're going the same speed. It doesn't matter which one's in front. That's something I didn't believe, you know, now I'm 10. I didn't believe that five years ago, but I do now. Okay? Of course, I, I don't remember that I didn't believe it five years ago, but I didn't, right? Then, it, when it comes, it's very difficult then to shift over and to say, well, when it comes to morals, I'm back to being Ben Dora and Skinner. Reinforcements and copying and, and, and modeling, okay? There's a, let's go back to the tablet again. There's a school um, approach to philosophy called eclecticism. Okay, I'm gonna start out now. My professor told me there's only two things you have to do to teach in a university. She said, read a chapter ahead of the students and admit your prejudices up front, then you'll be okay. Okay, so I don't like eclecticism. My problem with eclecticism is that different approaches come from very different assumptions of what a human being is. You can't say, well, when it comes, you know, when it comes to the physical universe, I'm, I'm on Piaget's side, people are constructing their own world. They're trying to make sense of it. But when it comes to morals, people aren't like that at all. People are just like, the tabula rasa that, that we talked about. People are just shaped by their environment completely. They don't have any sense of trying to make sense of it themselves and construct it. They learn everything. No in, there's nothing internal. You'll notice one person, 
Let's go back here. How do I get back up here? One person said, hmm, I think something may be internal. Maybe it's not all just wired in. So Kohlberg is going to tell us, come back to me now. Kohlberg is going to tell us, look, I'm on Piaget's side. And I'm going to be consistent. I'm not going to be an eclectic. By the way, there's a difference between eclecticism and pragmatism. Pragmatism says, do those things that work and that make sense in the environment. But pragmatists, like Dewey, for instance, have a consistent philosophical approach, right? They explain why pragmatism is a good way to do things. But if you have people saying, behavioral objectives, behavioral objectives, behavioral objectives, I don't want to hear any words like evaluate and criticize and critique and analyze. I just want specific behaviors. That's in your second period. And then the seventh period, the kids go to a course on critical thinking. I know in school where that happened. You're, you're barking up the wrong tree. If critical thinking is so important in the seventh period, why is, it, why is it a horrible thing in the second period? One teacher said, that she, she used a phrase from the seventh period class, the children be able to critically analyze, blah, blah, blah. Get that out of there. And then the, the seventh period class was doing critical analysis. Well, either it's important or it's not. You have to make up your mind. Kohlberg made up his mind. He said, I don't believe that people are simply shaped by the media and by their families and by their peers, that they simply model and learn by being reinforced for certain things and not for others. I believe they construct their own reality just the way Piaget said. <coughs> okay, so let's go to the PowerPoint for a second. Okay, there's Kober, there's a picture of him. He was one of my professors, by the way. And what he did was he said, just like Piaget, I want to get at kids moral reasoning, reasoning. Just the way Piaget said, I don't care about what your answer to a question is. I want to know your reasoning. So what he did is he gave people moral dilemmas. Okay, here's a dilemma. What do you do? And then he asked questions to probe their reasons, their reasoning for recommending a specific course of action. Okay. Okay, come back to me. And here, much more so than in Piaget, you're going to get rad you're, you're, this is going to be very important. So for instance, I have two people. Okay, here. <clears throat> These are my two people, right? Shiva and remind me your name again. Go ahead. Jennifer. And Jennifer. Shiva, move over here so they can see you. Okay? There's Shiva and there's Jennifer. Okay, Shiva, raise your hand. I ask them, are you for or against capital punishment? Shiva says, Shiva says, I'm against. Tell me why. Go ahead, quickly. Just a quick one. I don't think anybody has the right to capital, like, tell or decide whether somebody should die or not, you know. Okay, I could probe that a little more. Then I asked Jennifer, are you a for or against capital punishment? And Jennifer says, wait a minute, I'm gonna tell you what you said. Here, I'll tell you what you said. I'm gonna give it a little thing. You're scheduled to be executed in an hour for committing, uh, for murdering six people. Okay. Go ahead, are you for or against capital punishment, Jennifer? Against. Why? I don't wanna die. Okay, what, what do you mean die? What, what happened to you? I'm scheduled to be executed. Oh, she's scheduled to be executed for committing a mass murder that 10 people witnessed. There's no doubt she's guilty. So they're both against capital punishment. Now I ask, can you put the picture on the two of them again? Can we get the third person? Move over a little. Now I ask, remind me your name again? Lynn. I say to Lynn, Lynn, raise your hand. Lynn, are you for or against capital punishment? Lynn says, oh, I'm for it. Say, how come? She says, well, she's Jennifer's only living relative, and Jennifer owns a Lexus. They knock her off, I get the Lexus. <laughs> hey, you're for it, huh? You like a Lexus? I like a Lexus. Yeah, you're for you're knocking her off? We'll knock her Abs off. <laughs> absolutely, right? Now, so here are two people, go, go back on them, Two people who are against capital punishment, raise your hand. And two, one person who's for it. Okay, put it down. But, the two of you raise your hand. Piaget, uh, Kohlberg would say those two people are reasoning at the same level. What's in it for me? 
Do you care that you killed six people? Yeah, I care that somebody caught me. You care that she killed, killed six people? Care about the six people? No, I care about the Lexus. I don't care about anything else. And here's a person who says, wait a minute, I'm thinking about what rights people have vis-a-vis -vis other people. So Kohlberg is going to tell you, it's not your opinion that you have, you know, two people who have the same opinion. One is clearly, Shiva's clearly reasoning on a higher level. Ra get it back on them again. Shiva, raise your hand when I say your name. Shiva's clearly reasoning on a higher level than Jennifer, than Jennifer. And even though Jennifer and Lynn disagree with each other, they're reasoning on the same level. Low, by the way, mighty low, <laughs> okay? So this is what, okay, come, come back to the PowerPoint if you can. This is what Kohlberg talks about getting at moral reasoning. He wants to know how you're reasoning about something, okay? So P his theory, thank you, is an organismic developmental theory like Piaget's. He's talking about, he, matter of fact, he says, if you want to know what I think about how people develop, go read Piaget. I don't want to talk about it anymore, okay? I mean, he doesn't quite say it that way, but people go through stages. They organize and adapt to their, organize their environment and adapt to it. There's a universal invariant sequence of stages, and you got to get one stage right before you go to the next one. And unlike Piaget, he's going to say a lot of people, most people get stuck in a stage below the highest stage below the highest stage. He's going to say people get stuck, and that's bad for us, okay? And he, so here's what he's going to say. Just like Piaget, he's going to say all people are born with the same innate genetic abilities to assimilate and accommodate, right? Same thing. We're trying to take things in from the, universe, from the environment and make sense of them. That's assimilation, right? And at the same time, we're changing the way we think about the universe based on what we take in. And he said, what I'm talking about is, let's go to the, I'm sorry, go to the, the um, tablet if we can. Okay, he said I'm talking about the moral domain, moral problems. He said Piaget's theory is wonderful, but Piaget talks about the physical domain. Piaget talks about the physical world, if you will, not only the physical domain. And Kohlberg, the physical world, right, problems with the physical world. And I, Kohlberg, I talk about the moral domain. In fact, Piaget did talk about moral reasoning in children. And Kohlberg's theory, at least initially, said, what I'm doing is expanding what Piaget talked about. He talked about kids who are playing games. And did anybody ever, anybody ever play a game with a little kid, a three-year-old, a four-year-old? And what, what about the rules? Go ahead. They're what they say they are. Yeah. <laughs> I'm making up a new rule. They're what they say they are. Do the rules change, what, every two minutes? Yeah. Right? <laughs> okay. Yeah. That, that's sort of pre-operational reason. And then later, PSA will point out that there's a reason that says, wait a minute, there are rules. We all play by the rules. We understand what the rules are. Piaget did that. Kohlberg said he, great, so he said he was starting to expand Piaget's rules. Okay, so let's go back to the PowerPoint. And he says... All human societies present people with the same moral challenges. So he said, just like Piaget, the ability, we're adapting to the world, and the world is the same. We're adapting to the same environment. I know what you're all thinking, that, right? What, are you kidding? Oh, we're taking a vote. Come back to me. We're taking a vote. How many people think that all human societies have the same moral challenges to all of us? Two people. How many people think no? Everybody else, okay? Yeah. We've got a multiculturalism running, running rampant around here, around American academia. But let's think about this for a second. Let's just think about it for a second. Who can tell me something that's common to all human societies when it comes to the way that they run their societies. What's common to all human societies when it comes to how, what goes on in a society? Go ahead. That was a hierarchy? Over to you, won't it? Oh, yeah. yeah, go ahead. A hierarchy? Okay, there's all, so there's a hierarchy based upon what? Status. Okay, there's a certain status hierarchy, and we have to ask ourselves, what do we think about this status hierarchy? What else? 
there are dozens of things. I mean, I can name things, medicine and education and, and uh, some sort of religion or ultimate explanation. And, but what about just how society is run? How do we decide? How do we decide about what to do in a society? What's okay to do and what's not okay to do? What else is in all human societies? Go ahead. They all have a set of rules. Rules. There are rules in all human society, rules. Some of them are formal rules, like you can't run a red light. And some of them are informal rules. You don't go to university classes wearing a bikini, right? Nobody, that's not a rule on the books, but nobody does it. It's just, right? It's just considered the thing to do or. Okay, we have rules. There are people in society. And these rules govern how people are to act toward one another. And I have to decide, as an individual, what's my relationship to the rules? Freud is going to tell you, people are going to bore with the attitude, to hell with the rules. I'm only obeying the rules, right? That they're initially, I don't want to, I want what's good for me. Then they come to saying, well, I'll obey the rules because I got in trouble if I don't. And finally they get a conscience. But should I obey the rules? If I'm going to disobey the rules, when should I disobey them? Why do I disobey them? What's my responsibility to the rules and what's responsibility to the other people in my society? How many people think all things being equal that basically it's immoral to break the law. You have to vote yes or no. Who thinks it's immoral to break the law? We're taking a vote, none of this stuff. <laughs> Who thinks it's immoral to break the law, by and large, right? It's immoral to break the law. Okay, those who think it's immoral to break the law, we are, this is a Monday and Wednesday class. Okay, this semester is being recorded. It's being recorded during the spring semester. And the class started not on a Monday, but on a Wednesday. The semester started on Tuesday, not Monday, because the Monday was, we'll push it down. Holiday. What holiday was it? Martin Luther King Day. Boy, did he break laws. Whew, did he break laws. He broke more laws than you can shake a stick at, right? Whites sit here, blacks sit, whites sit on the right side, blacks sit on the left side. I'm sitting on the right side, I don't care. He encouraged other people to break the law. We have a national holiday to him. Summer school semester, we cram it in in most universities, you cram it in so it ends before, the first semester ends before and the second one starts after July 4th. Another federal holiday to a bunch of lawbreakers, right? Throwing tea over the harbor and rebellion. That was out and out rebellion against the government. At least Martin Luther King didn't take up guns, right? He believed in civil disobedience, in, in peaceful disobedience. <coughs> George Washington's birthday used to be a holiday. Now it's, now it's President's Day. But we used to get off for George Washington's birthday when I was in, in school. Came out on a Wednesday, he had the Wednesday off. Yeah, yeah. So, Feb February 22nd, February 23rd, February 22nd, I think. Anyway, so it's maybe there's a certain amount of respect for lawbreakers. I think I told you this already, Martin Luther King is my hero. I don't care if he's passe, I don't care anything else, he's my hero. Greatest American at the end of the uh, second half of the 20th century and so far in the 21st century, I haven't seen anybody comes even close. So, so far, we can hope. But in any case, so, and he broke laws. So what we have here is an idea that Koberg is going to tell you of, wait a minute. There are a lot of people who don't approve of going in and robbing a gas station who do approve of what Martin Luther King did. Okay? I'm one of them. All right? So he's going to say, in every society, we have laws. 
Should you break the law? Should you not break the law? How should you not break the law? What should you do? He said, and that, that's universal. That applies everywhere. What's your relationship to the law and to other people? You'll notice just quite quickly, although you've got to interview a lot, but Shiva gave us one sentence. And her one sentence about capitalist punishment didn't have much to do with society and laws. It had to do with interpersonal relationships. One person doesn't have a right to take the life of another person, right? Now, I didn't probe it enough. You've got to probe and ask questions, and I didn't have time here. But it's interesting. She's saying, never, there, there maybe there are laws, but there are also, I have to understand how people relate to each other, okay? So all of these things come into play in every society. Okay. How we view other people is extraordinarily important. Just from that one sentence, it's pretty clear to me that she, because I didn't mention anything about the people. She didn't say, well, can you tell me something about the religion of the person who's going to be executed? Can you tell me something about the ethnic background? It was pretty clear from her answer that her initial thought was, that her basic underlying premise is that people are people, all people are equal when it comes to their right to life, right? That's a basic underlying premise that she has. Not everybody has that premise, right? Those people are subhumans. They're, they're the descendants of monkeys and dogs. They're, they're meant to serve other people. They're right. They're not, okay? Even, I'll give you an example. Uh, most of, I, I, some of you know the, the idea of uh, sending liberated slaves back to Liberia, right? Some people were for, uh, virulently, virulently, let's go to the tablet, that word, vir, vir, virulently, virulently I pronounce it, but since I got, okay, adamantly, come back to me, overwhelmingly opposed to slavery, right? Were part of this back to Africa movement. Some of them, not all of them, everybody in that movement was adamantly opposed to slavery, said it's because, well, blacks are people, but they're intellectually inferior. So what are we gonna do with them? Can't keep them slaves, can't keep them slaves, but how can they participate in a democracy? Let's sort of send them back where they came from and let them figure it out over there, right? Some of that was people who are a little better at say, wait, what about Frederick Douglass and a few other <laughs> brilliant minds who happen to be black? But that was, a, uh, that was a, different, a different question, okay? So are people equal? Do you consider people equal? Do we make laws based on that or do we make laws based on other things? And that's what Kohlberg is dealing with. Once again, he's going to tell you there are universal, there's a universal developmental sequence that comes in answering those questions. Okay, let's go back to the PowerPoint. Just let me tell you that Heinz, okay, the way Kohlberg tends to get at people's moral reasoning is with what he calls this Heinz dilemma. And there's the dilemma. A woman is near death from a, a unique kind of cancer, and there's a drug that could save her. The drug costs about $4,000. The sick woman's husband, Hines, went to everyone he knew to borrow the money and tried every legal means, but he could only get together about 2,000. He asked a doctor scientist who discovered the drug, he used to be a pharmacist, these things have changed, for a discounter to let him pay later, but, but the, he refused. He said, I'm not going to let you pay. I'm not going to do it. I spent a lot of time, a lot of money on this, or, right? I need to make a profit from it. It's $4,000 a dose. Do you want to try it on your wife? You got to come up with a four grand or else, never mind. Go away. Okay? And then we have a series of questions. Should Hein break into the Labrador to steal the drug for his wife? Why or why not? Okay? In the second scenario, you got to have to take my picture out of there for a second. Okay? And Heinz broke into the laboratory and stole the drug. We're told that. The next day, the newspaper reporters reported the break-in and theft. And Brown, a police officer and a friend of Hyde's, remember seeing Fines last <coughs> evening, behaving suspiciously, sometimes it says running away from the laboratory. Later that night, he saw Hines running away from the laboratory. And there it is. Should Brown report what he saw? In other words, should he turn in Hines? Okay, why or why not? 
And then three, Brown was reported what he saw. You're told after you get the answer to this, you're told Brown reported what he saw, and Hines was arrested and brought to court, and he was found guilty, then you're asked, what should the judge do? Okay? So, once again, oops, sorry. Once again, the answer is what counts. Not just for instance, I had one kid who said, absolutely, this guy I think was eight, said, absolutely should break in and steal the drug. So I said, why? He said, if his wife dies, who's going who's gonna to do his laundry? Who's going to cook his meals? Who's going to clean the floor for him? Right? In other words, me, 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 me. <laughs> right? <coughs> I had another kid, by the way, also about the same issue. Nope. Heinz will get in trouble. There are actually other questions. I, I just gave you a brief synopsis. You're asked, does it make a difference if Heinz loves, Heinz loves his wife or not? If people say, yeah, Heinz should break, steal the drug, should he steal the drug if he hears that someone he doesn't know is sick from this form of cancer? Should he steal the drug for someone who's not, who he doesn't even know? For those of you, and it's most of us, I think, who, who said, okay, he should steal the drug, and said, well, I'm not sure for a stranger we never met. Why? Why is a stranger's life more important than his wife's life, right? Those are the kinds of questions you probe and answer. Should he steal the drug for an animal? People try to wiggle. Well, if he steals it for the animal, then what about a human being? Maybe there won't be enough for people who need the drug. No, there's plenty of medicine. Now what? Okay. And of course, you keep probing and asking based upon where the person is going. So for instance, the, the, the best thing that a Piagetian can hear, or Koberg in this case, is, well, I can think of reasons why he can, should steal the drug and reasons why he shouldn't steal the drug. Oh, whenever I hear that, ah, oh, my little heart goes piddle patter. Oh, it's wonderful. Tell me all the reasons why you think he should. Tell me all the reasons why you think he shouldn't. I can get more reasoning. Right? Explain it to me. What do you think? Right? One kid even told me, Officer Brown should turn in Hines because there might be a reward and they'll get the money. <laughs> Some people say, well, if he doesn't turn him in, he'll get in trouble. Is that different from saying, look, he's got a job to do. If he doesn't do the job that's found out, he'll lose the job. Those are really pretty much the same. The other one's just a little more sophisticated way of saying the same thing. But it's okay. It's really not saying the same thing. Okay? And saying, look, he's got a job to do, and we expect him to do the job because society would be in chaos if he didn't do the job. That's saying something else altogether different. There are other people to decide whether he should be punished or not, whether he's guilty or not. That's not the cop's job. Yeah, that's a different answer. But you can give an answer and say, yeah, it is the cop's job. Cops, you know, they don't turn in every infraction they see. Do you realize that if police actually, actually reported and turned in everyone who committed a legal infraction, nobody would have a driver's license. Three speeding tickets, you lose your driver's license. How many people would lose their driver's license in a day? How many people speed three times a day? Everybody, right? As a matter of fact, it's to the point where you're aware of the fact that if you're in a 35 mile an hour speed zone and you're going 38, you're speeding. Everybody assumes, oh, it's 40, right? No, it's 35. The cops just say, oh, for three miles an hour, I'm not, gonna, <laughs> I'm not gonna worry about it, right? How many people go 25 miles an hour through a, through a what do you call it, zone? School. Through a school zone. Hey, everybody, you all go 20, exactly. How many people wait until you're past the sign be, and school zone before you speed up? Three or four of us. How many people, you see the sign, once you're past the school, you speed up. So that you're going through the time you hit the sign. Okay, I mean, okay, so it's interesting. You know, there are a lot of different ways to think these things through. Is there anybody who happens to know, who maybe go, when you see a cop has pulled someone over for speeding, you may go a little bit faster because you know the cop in that district is busy with the person pulled over. Anybody do that? My hand's up, <laughs> okay? 
on freeways, right? See, here somebody says there might be another cop, right? <laughs> on freeways, I don't, because I'm suspicious. But in a neighborhood, when the constable's got someone pulled over, I know there's only one constable in the neighborhood. I'm off. Not 50 miles an hour, but I'm up from 32 to 36, right? <laughs> just, just in case, you know. One time, as a matter of fact, I knew a neighbor of mine, he got furious. He saw the constable was busy with someone, so he starts to speed, and an HPD cop just happened to be going through the neighborhood and pulled him over, right? He was furious. He's, I said, you were speeding. What are you upset about? Okay, so you have to be careful about all these things. So this is what Kohlberg tells us, right? But this is just to give you a flavor of how Kohlberg goes at this, okay? And here's what we have here. What Kohlberg basically said is, I'm going to find stages parallel to Piaget's stages, okay, in the moral domain. Piaget worried about the physical and geometric and other things. We talked mostly about the physical. I'm going to worry about the social domain, and particularly about morals. So he said, I'm going to find pre-operational reasoning in, related to moral problems concrete operational reasoning related to moral problems, and formal operational reasoning related to moral problems. Okay, before we go on, I have to tell you something. Come back to me for a second, then we'll go back. Piaget wrote in French. He was from Switzerland, French speaking part of Switzerland, so he wrote in French. Uh, I don't know French, so I don't know how it happened, but there are different translations of Piaget's work. I told you the word sensory motor can be spelled four different ways at least. Most people, most people, translated Piaget's work saying there are stages, concrete operational stage, formal operational stage, sensory motor stage, etc. pre-operational stage, even though it's not a real stage. And then there may be sub-stages, right? There are sub-stages. But some people, so those people said there's a, a, a sensory motor stage and six sub-stages. We covered some of those briefly. I didn't call them sub-stages, right? But some people translated it not as stage but as a level. So they said there's a sensory motor level and there are six stages within the level. Okay, here I'll show it to you. Let's go to this. So most people said stage, stage, and for instance in formal operations and substage. In formal operations it's too advanced for the this course to Vincent Cousin, there are two substages. But some people translated it level. So what these people called a stage, these people called a level and stage. And what these people called a substage, these people called a stage. <coughs> right? So a stage here equals a level here, and a stage here equals a substage here. Just from the translations. Whoever taught Colbert Piaget taught him this vocabulary. So he says, I have three levels with two stages at each level. If he had asked me, he knew me, but he never asked me, right? I was one of his students. I would have said, say you have three stages and two substages at each level. But he didn't ask me. Besides, his theory was very well developed by the time we met, right? I mean, obviously, this is just the way he wrote. And since he wrote in English, there's not much I can do about it, right? Piaget, I can pick the translation I want. Because this is how my professor taught me this way. But Kohlberg's professor, who taught him in the four, late 40s or the 50s, actually, taught him this way. So we're going to have to go this way. Okay? As I said, he wrote in English, so I can't, I can't piddle with it. Right? He's an American. He wrote in English, and that's that. Okay, so let's go back to the PowerPoint. So Kohlberg's going to say there's a pre-operational level that Piaget has, and I have a parallel level called pre-conventional with two sub-stages. Piaget also, oops, sorry. Piaget also talks about the concrete operational level, and I call that pre-conventional reasoning. Pre-conventional reasoning is pre-operational reasoning applied to moral problems. Conventional reasoning is concrete operational reasoning applied to moral problems, and once again, there are two stages here. And finally, he said, I found formal operational reasoning, I call it post-conventional reasoning, and this is formal operational reasoning applied to moral problems. I know I should just make this slide one whole thing, right? 
And so I have three levels with two stages at each level. And I said, we have to use that terminology because that's the terminology he used. Okay, then you run it. Okay, so let's look at these one at a time. He said, obviously, young children, but not only young children. Well, let me say this up front. Unlike Piaget, Piaget is going to tell you, unless there's some, some kind of neurological or physiological uh, damage, right, or genetic damage, it's going to be very, it, it, people are all going to get at least a concrete operational reasoning. Or unless there's severe environmental deprivation. I knew one kid who was who was environmentally pre-operational. He was 15, a very strange home background. He was basically homeschooled, quote unquote. The only people he saw were his mother and his tutor. His father was on the road earning money. He had never had much exposure to anything in the world. He just sat and did drill sheets on stuff he didn't understand. It was creepy. And I worked with him when we got him up, but that's a very unusual situation. Or the kids who are locked up in closets. Kids who are locked up in closets, they come out severely retarded because they, no, they have no environment whatsoever. But by and large, most people functioning in the world, if they don't have any sort of physiological damage, are going to get to conventional reasoning. Piaget, and, and most people will get to at least some form of formal operational reasoning. Kohlberg says that's not true. As a matter of fact, he's going to say, most adults are functioning at this level, and we have plenty of people functioning at this level. When you find people at this level, watch out. They are very dangerous. OK, so let's see if we can do this. OK. So we're going to talk about pre-conventional reasoning, okay? Let's see if you can, I'm sorry, if you can figure it out, okay? Pre-operational reasoning means you see everything from your own perspective, right? Right? So pre-conventional reasoning would mean what? If we apply that to morality, what would that mean? Everything from your own perspective. Go ahead. Instinctive, like whatever you feel. Whatever you feel. And what, what's, what's moral? I'm asking a question. What's moral? And you, you're pre-operational. Everything's from your own perspective. What's moral? Anything you think is moral. Anything what? Anything and, you think or feel is moral. Yeah, but what would, what would feel moral to you? What would you think is moral? What um, everybody agrees agree to, basically. No, why everybody agrees to. I don't care about other people. Everything's from my perspective. Go ahead. Uh, I think uh, that's something that's beneficial for you and yeah. only you. Something that's good for you. Something that's beneficial for you. Me, everything's from my perspective. Me, 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 me. Right? Let's go back to the PowerPoint. Exactly. Very good. Whoops. Sorry, I hit the wrong button. I'm always hitting the wrong button. Okay. There's no ability to take the perspective of the other. Okay? What's moral is what's good for me. Okay? So at stage one, I do that which brings me reward or pleasure, and I avoid that which brings me punishment or pain. What does this sound like? You do what gives you pleasure, and you don't do what gives you punishment. You do what gives you reward, and you don't do what gives you punishment. What does that sound like? Id. Who? Freud. Sounds like Freud's id. Yeah. And what learning theorist does it sound like? That's exactly right. Sounds like Freud's id. And what learning theorist does it sound like? If it gives you pleasure, you'll do it more. If it doesn't, you'll stop doing it. Oh. Who's that sound like? Huh? You do what you're rewarded for and stop doing what you're punished for. Who does that sound like? Behavioral. Say it. Put, say it. Skinner. Yeah. Skinner. Say it. Behavioralism. Skinner. Behaviorism. Skinner. So Piaget says to Skinner, you're absolutely right about people at their lowest level, their lowest level of functioning the lowest stage of functioning, you're right about people. By the way, he's saying the same thing to Freud. You're absolutely right about Freud that all they want is pleasure at the lowest level of functioning. Okay? I don't have the ability to take the perspective of the other. So I come up, follow me around. <clears throat> Jennifer, start to write something. He's writing something. I come up and I say, hey, give me that's mine. <laughs> Teacher comes and says, how would you feel if she did that to you? I have no idea. 
<laughs> I have no idea how I feel she did that to me. I can't take her perspective. I can't put myself in her shoes. All I know is I want it. But that's cute, give me it's mine. Take this back. But if I come up like this and say, give me it's mine, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's not so cute. If I'm not three anymore, but I'm 23, it's not cute anymore. That's why I said you got to watch people. Then it's frightening. Then it's frightening. Okay? So at this stage, I do that which one brings pain, right? Let's go back to the PowerPoint. Pleasing powerful others is the basis of morality because they're the ones who can reward me and give me pleasure. Right? The basis is reinforcement and punishment. And powerful others is the basis of morality. The people who can reward me and punish me, what's moral is pleasing them. But if I can get what I, I'm a little kid, when I get older, and I can just stick the gun in Jennifer's face and take what I want, then I don't have to police power follows. All I have to do, but I have to avoid them. I have to be sure I do it in a way, I try to do it in a way that avoids the cops, but not always. Okay, I got to tell you a story. Come back to me here. When I first got to Houston, there was a guy, he walked into a store, right? And the story came out, he shot the clerk and stole some beer. It came out later, somebody actually was in the store and heard the conversation, right? There were witnesses around. He went in and he said, I need some beer. It was halftime of the football game. He gets the beer, the clerk said, that beer, I don't know, eight dollars, whatever it was. Guys only have six. Clerk says, well, it's not enough. There's a beer there that only costs six. You know, I want this beer. Clerk said, well, you can't have it. Well, they get this thing. Took out a gun and, and killed the guy. Took the beer and walked away. There were a couple witnesses in the store. One of them, of course, they hid, but as he was walking away, he was walked out. When they went and they peeked and they saw he went into an apartment complex, you know, right next to the store. They told the cops, the cops checked all the buildings, there he was sitting drinking the beer watching a football game. That's frightening. I want what I want, never mind. Okay? So pleasing, powerful, uh, right? I just want what I want. What happens to you, what do I care? Let's go back to PowerPoint. There's one more thing that's important here. Actions are judged by their consequences, not by their intent. I'll give you an example. Okay? Come back to me. This is called one of Kovac's famous exa favorite examples. Johnny's mother tells him, Johnny, it's your turn to clean the table and bring the dishes to the sink. Every week we take turns. Last week I did it, the week before your brother did it, the week before your sister, the week before your father did it, now it's your turn. I don't want to do it. No, I don't want to do it. Well, you have to do it, everyone takes turns. No, 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 I want to go outside. So his mother makes him do it. So, well, you have to do it. And he, so he takes the dish, and at the end, he's bringing the last dish in. He's so mad that he takes the dish, he throws it on the floor and smashes it. Okay? That's story number one. Story number two, Sally. Sally's mother helps with the dishes. She explains the same thing. We take turns, and Sally says, oh, yes, mother, I know it's my turn. And she gladly takes the dishes. And here, let me, I've got to show you, I'll do a little acting here. She's got three dishes stacked up, Okay? She's got three dishes stacked up. She's carrying the last three dishes in. And as she goes, she trips on a chair like this. The dishes go flying, all three break. From the point of view of these people, who did the worst thing? It's obvious. Who did the worst thing from the point of view of people reasoning here at this level? Uh, Sally. Go ahead, Sa go ahead. Sally. Why? Because she broke three, not She one. broke three, he broke one. What are you, stupid? It's obvious. Since I cannot judge intent, I can't enter get into people's head and say, wait, he did it on purpose. For her, it was an accident. That's why this is low-level reasoning, right? From th that point of view, I only judge what happened. I only judge what happened. He broke three, she broke one. Okay? Now, in our laws, intent makes a big difference. Okay? 
If you get into a car when you're drunk and have an accident and do something, okay, you're punished more than if you weren't drunk. I know one guy, they accused him of being drunk. Actually, had an accident, he killed somebody. This was many years ago. And they accused him of being drunk, he was acting drunk, and he was in big trouble. He was a clergyman, too, as a matter of fact. And he said, I'm not drunk, I wasn't drunk. Later, it turned out that he was on a medicine. He was on a medicine. For he was pretty sick, he died young because of this, right? whatever he had. He was on this medicine, and the doctor had not told him, and the pharmacist had not told him, there was no warning so many years ago, that this can impair, you know, you have these warnings, don't operate heavy machinery, right, including cars. They didn't put a warning on there, and he didn't know. Took the medicine, got in the car, and as he was driving, he, he became impaired, and he just, he lost it, and he got off. I was considered an accident because he wasn't drunk. His intent was made a difference. The person was dead, but it wasn't considered, you know, it wasn't because he was, he was purposely drunk. And, and the doctor testified for him, and the doctor said it was probably my fault. So, well, that was a rough one. He's a friend of mine, I remember. He just said, he said, I, I don't know what happened. I can't believe I was drunk. Finally, finally, the doctor came forward and said it's, it was the medicine, okay? That's the intent. He didn't intend to drive drunk. He was drunk, he was impaired, but he didn't intend to do it, okay? So actions are judged by their consequences, not by their intent. Did you do it? And you'll often hear kids at this stage say, okay, I come up and I do to Jennifer what I did, right? I grabbed her pen, I pushed her, remember? I pushed her and I grabbed her pen. Be three years old, what are you gonna do? Go ahead. I go, right, she hits me, right? Or so she hits me in the head. Teacher comes up. And I am honestly convinced. I said, I just pushed, she hit. <laughs> and we know hitting's worse than pushing, right? The kids have that. Yeah, but you started it. No, it doesn't matter. She did it worse. She hit, I just pushed, or I just grabbed. Let's say I just grabbed it without pushing her. I just grabbed, she hit, right? She hit my hand, I just grabbed. But you started, why don't you mind your own business? It's her pen. No, no, they, and they're honestly convinced of this. You can tear your hair out. Who's ever worked with little kids like this, right? Am I right? It can drive you nuts. I worked for a little while with little kids. It drove me nuts. I said, I better go to middle school, right? <laughs> Those crazinesses I can handle, but they're just, you know, they have their own thing. But it, it's unbelievable. It's all what's good for me, 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 me judging by intentions, and by the way, one good thing about these kids is it's easy to manipulate them because stand in line, you'll get a cookie. Don't stand in line, you don't get a cookie, right? Whoever sits quietly for 35 minutes can be the line leader, ooh, be the line leader, eh? right? Elementary school teachers hate kids who get to the next stage because it's not so easy to manipulate. Don't do this, do that. I mean, they're very easy to manipulate. And it's interesting, animals are like this. You can manipulate them with, with you know, with, uh, with food. Little kids, it works too. Oh, a smiley face, oh good, I'll do it. Right, and then teachers get shocked when it doesn't work with adolescents. Who said peers? All of a sudden, boy, you're right about peers. I don't give a damn. I'm a 14-year-old boy and I give a damn whether a female teacher gives me a smiley face. You wanna? You want to get a kid teaching a 13 or 14 year old, if you're a female teacher, I say, oh, you're such a nice boy. It's such a pleasure to have you. You're so sweet and kind, right? You probably won't make it alive to the next class. Right? That happened to me once a teacher did that to me. I held her once. I was, I was in seventh grade. Oh, boy, it was miserable. What'd you do, kiss her? <laughs> right? What are you, an apple polisher? What are you, and a few other words I can't use, right? <laughs> on television. I mean, talk about peers getting on you, right? It was miserable, okay? I still remember her name to this day, okay? Okay, now, what Kohlberg says, stage two, let's go back to the PowerPoint, is still pre-conventional reasoning. I still feel that was morals was good for me, but it's some cognitive ability does begin to emerge. And I understand that others also have motivations, but since I'm so self-centered and so egocentric, I assume that others have the same most selfish motivation that I do. So I try to manipulate others in order to get my way. 
You give me what I want and I'll give you what you want. Okay? Colbert calls this a market exchange. This is often called in the literature and market exchange morality, but when I took a course from Colbert, he called it, I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine. That was what he always called it. Right later, oh, a fancy, a fancy textbook, you have to call it market exchange. You give me something and I'll do something. Okay. Now, first thing I have to say, come back to me for a second, this is not seen as a contract. I'll, st I'll keep picking on the same three people. Shiva and I make a deal, okay? Shiva, there's, there's Shiva, right? She and I make a deal. Shiva, you any good in math? Yeah, okay, good. I say to Shiva, listen, you do my, we're both at this stage, you do my math homework for me and I'll do your math home, your English, are you good in English? Better in math or English? Better in math, good. I'll do your English homework for you, because I'm much better in English. That's immoral to other people's homework? Forget about it, you're talking to a blank wall. We don't care about that. We just care about getting by this, okay? Okay, it's a deal. This goes on for a few days. Then Lynn comes to me and she says, you know what? I'll do your math and your science homework, because she really hates English, if you'll do my English homework for me. I gotta think this through. That's, I'll, I'll take that deal in a second, except I gotta be careful. Does Shiva have an older brother who will beat the hell out of me if I don't bring the homework? But once I determine no, Shiva comes the next day and says, where's your, where's your, screw you lady. <laughs> Right? Or, right? I got a better deal over here. There's no sense that I have an obligation toward her. No sense we made a deal. Of course, she's just trying to pull one on me because, unbeknownst to me, she didn't do the math homework for me because she made a better deal with, with the Jennifer, right? Pick on the same people. You made a better deal with Jennifer. Jennifer's going to pay her 10 bucks on top of everything else, right? Whatever. <laughs> So there's a sense here of, I'll try to get you, I'll give you what you want if you give me what I want. If you don't, the hell with you. And I'm gonna assume that you're selfish. I'm going to assume that you're out to get me the way I'm out to get you. It's no longer just me, me, me. I understand other people have motives. Right? Right? This is Kohlberg's explanation for people with paranoid tendencies. There's another thing, Levinger's theory, which is a more expansive theory, L-O-E-V-I-N-G-E-R here. I'll just put the name in case people are interested in this. I lost the pen. Thank you. Here, come to the tablet. Jane Levinger. And she describes personalities like that, right? And she, it's a very interesting theory. We don't have time in this course, but it's, it's kind of like Kohlberg's theory, except it's Come back to me now. It's much more expansive, right? L-O-E-V-I-N-G. It talks about more than just morality. And she has people write, filling in sentences, I am, the trouble with, okay? I am, and you get people at this stage saying, I am, none of your business, right? Um, my problem is, you have to fill it out, right? Taking this stupid test. Okay. My mother never get me, gave me what she should have given me. You know, very low level kinds of reasoning. But it's, but the first two, playing it close to your chest, not trusting anybody. You know nobody's to be trusted because you're not to be trusted. I'll step Shiva in the back in a minute. If I get a better deal from Lynn, of course I know that, and I assume that they'll step me in the back in a minute. Okay. Now, like Piaget's theory, this theory assumes that each stage is better, more adaptive than the other one. You can see how this is more adaptive than stage one. Now I'm not just trying to please powerful others, I can manipulate people. Oh boy, do, do a kindergarten and nursery school teachers hate kids who are at this stage, right? Now the kid says, everybody get in, everybody stand in line, I'll give you a cookie. And there's one kid who says, no. I'll stand in line if you make me the line leader. That was the issue with one of my sons. I want to be the line leader. You can't be the line leader. Get down on the floor. No! 
I don't care about cookies. Cookies are, I don't know, what did he say, caca or whatever they used to say, right? He's got a better goal in mind. He wants to be the line leader. Right? I'll do it your way, you do it, right? You want to do it? And by the way, this is all the stuff, sting operations, et cetera, assume this, assume everybody's greedy. Now, you, you, under, you understand that if I can get away with getting from you what I want without giving you what you need, I'll do it in a minute. I don't care about you. Okay? I want you to know, you all pay taxes more or less? You don't know how much of your tax money goes into this. Does anybody know the term pork barrel bills? The last day of Congress, this is heaven knows where I can, where are these? It's a room full of representatives. I want a bridge in my district, and she wants a new federal building in her district, and she wants a bay dredge in her district, and she wants... She wants a, a new spur on a federal highway to connect in her district, and she wants, uh, uh, right? Uh, she wants, uh, what else is these federal programs? I don't know, she wants a dam in her district. And he wants uh, uh, an expansion of uh, a, a defense plan in his district. Throw all the bills in the hopper, and everybody votes for all the bills. It's called pork bill. Sometimes it's called log rolling. You vote for my bill, I'll vote for yours. Hundreds of millions of dollars going to these bills and nobody nobody knows. I don't care. You vote for mine. I'll vote for yours Bring it back get the defense plan in his district. He's got the jobs. I've got the new road in my district I've got the jobs. She's got the bay dredged in her district wherever it was all the rich people will have homes on the bay and boats on the bay There are the bay starting to still the dredge it. They're gonna make big contributions to my campaign I'm all set here you give me when you, and boy, if you vote no, whoo, you got troubles. You'll never get another thing passed in your district you've added. I'm exaggerating a little. But that's how it works. Yeah, go ahead. I think there was an Alfred Hitchcock movie where two people got together that were strangers and they plotted to kill the other spouse. All right. Throw Mama off the train. It wasn't, <laughs> that wasn't Alfred Hitchcock. That was uh, Danny DeVito and uh, who was the other one? Uh, Billy Crystal, right. I, I, one, right, but th there was a movie that actually like that, a real scary one, and then they made a spoof on it, right? You kill my mother and I'll kill your wife, that kind of thing. <laughs> they both wanted to get rid of it. <laughs> and it was, it was just a perfect setup, because perfect setup, I don't know. What it, but the truth is, if I, can ki if I can kill your mother, if I can get you to kill my wife without killing your mother, and I can get away with it, you can't do anything to me, I'll do it. Because why should I risk getting in trouble? You get in trouble. Then I'll lie through my, see, he's a liar. I never made any deal with him. I don't know why he did it. Probably wanted to rob my wife and somebody came, you know, that kind of stuff. I have no, my, sting operations work this way. I assume you're greedy and you get the stuff, right? Okay, so this is, so this, this works great, okay? People have often pointed out that one of the weaknesses in Kohlberg's theory is, let's go back to the PowerPoint for a second, that you can live forever here. Why would you want to develop beyond this? Okay, and here's the answer. Come, come back to me for a second. The truth is, this is okay. I can make a living exploiting everyone here by that, by cheating you, by selling you shoddy products, giving you a guarantee that doesn't have a backup. Did you ever see this thing? Good forever, a guarantee for life. Two weeks later, the company's out of business. <laughs> That's the end of the guarantee for life, right? Take the product, it breaks. Tough noogies, right? That's stage two morality, a piece of, one time, Somebody made a fortune saying, guaranteed, a guaranteed cockroach killer, right? Five dollars, right? Out you have, and what the person sold, the person made a fortune and kept running from state to state, and the lawyer d defended him too. In the thing, you got two blocks of wood, and it said, take block A, and they were labeled A and B, take block A, put it on the table, 
take the cockroach, put it on top of block A, and slam block B on top of block A. <laughs> it's a guaranteed cockroach killer. It's a scam, right? And of course it said, don't pay fancy money. This thing is only $2 and it's guaranteed, right? It's trying to get at your greed, too. It's exploitive, it's this kind of thing, right? It's not walking in and trying to blow somebody's head up, but it's, it's, it can be. If I think I can get away with it, I'll do it. If I think I can fool you, I'll do it, but I'm manipulating. I don't trust anybody. But I can own, but a society like this can only work, a person like this can only work because the rest of us don't live that way. Okay, I make a deal, I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine. I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine. They make a deal, I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine. Because I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine. Meanwhile, they've made a deal to stab me in the back, <laughs> right? And the deal that we made stabs him in the back. Don't worry, he's made a deal to stab me and the two of us in the back. He's all right, he's hanging in there, right? It's all, I don't trust anybody, play your cards close to your chest. There's no way to cooperate. I'm eternally suspicious of people. It's like a constant paranoia is what it really is. Cobra doesn't deal in mental diseases, but that's really what it is. Watch out. By the way, I had one therapist who actually gave, it was either these tests or Levenger's tests, to his, who, to his clients who were, who were um, diagnosed with various degrees of paranoia and they, most of them were at this stage. Some of them were psychotic, but the ones who weren't psychotic were at this stage. They just didn't trust anybody. You can't run a society like that. There have to be things we all agree <coughs> upon. Okay? You can't run. And Kohlberg says, ultimately, you come to realize that if you're going to be a functioning member of society and deal in some way so that there are certain ways we can get along without having to watch your back all the time and watch out and who's out to get me, right? Imagine if you walked into the university and you thought, every professor that I have is going to give me grades based upon whether it's good for that professor or not. Imagine that. So if this professor thinks that by giving me a grade lower than I earn, it'll show something about some research that, today's a he day, that he's conducting, Right? And it'll get him a grant he doesn't give a damn about me. Imagine that. Imagine that every time you belong to a group, you thought everybody in that group was out to get everybody else. What's in it for me? It'd be pretty tough to live that way. So Kohlberg says what ultimately happens, and it is, is that we realize that you cannot live this way, in particular since very soon when you act this way, people say, I don't want anything to do with you. I'm not going to make any deals with you. It's going to get around what I did to, to Shiva, right? And even if among the people who wouldn't cheat on their homework or wouldn't say, okay, I'll do you, I say, don't deal with him. Even if it's something that's honest, don't deal with him. He'll try to get you. Don't make a deal with him about anything. It's going to get around. Either. Okay, so ultimately I need to develop, let's go back to the PowerPoint for one second, to conventional reasoning. And in conventional reasoning, Rules, laws, etc. Here, let me click this. In conventional reasoning, the person that develops an inability to understand both interpersonal reciprocity and rules and norms that apply to all. Okay? So what's moral is what's normative and what's legal. Rules and laws are now more important than the individual. They're more important than your individual desire. At stage three is what's normative and what's legal. Okay, that's what's moral. That's the right thing to do. Okay, the right thing to do is to follow the rules. Okay, and by the way, there are a lot of therapies that are based upon this. Getting kids, most kids who are, what we used to call juvenile delinquents, I don't know what you call them now, who are really outside the law and doing this, especially kids who are on their own, not members of gangs, they're pre-conventional. And you try to get them to understand, obey the rules, obey the laws, obey the laws. And I saw a kid who was going through therapy like this, and I once asked him, what happens if the law is, is, a, is a bad law? What happens if the rule is a bad rule? And he stood there and he looked at me, and his eyes glazed over. He didn't quite get it. 
<laughs> and then the guy came, I was visiting, he said, shut up. Yeah, I was a graduate student at the time. I said, we're getting to the point where he's paying the laws. Stop screwing us up. Get the hell out of here. <laughs> okay? He basically threw me out. Okay? So at stage three, morality consists of following the rules and norms of the group. Those who do not follow them or cannot meet them, group standards, are considered to be evil or bad and not worthy of respect. I'm going to show you a norm, for instance, okay? Come to, come put the camera on me, watch me. Put the camera on me, watch me, okay? I'm eating, I'm in the black eyed pea, right? And I have ordered meatloaf, mashed potatoes, and gravy on the side. I am not going to start to eat. Pick up the meatloaf, dunk it in the, the gravy's over here. Dunk it in the gravy and buy it. Now the mashed potato. I stick my fingers in the mashed potatoes, dunk it in the gravy. More mashed potatoes, dunk it in the gravy. Yeah. Who's disgusted? <laughs> Everybody. I'm not really doing it. Now there's no law against eating that way. There's no law against eating that way. We just, it's a norm, okay? It's a norm. There's no law to walk on the right, okay? There's a law to drive on the right, but not to walk on the right, but we all do it. Anybody ever visit England? I must have bumped into 500 people in England, right, walking on the right, because they walk on the left, okay? It's a norm, okay? You just do it that way. Okay, as I said, nobody wears bikinis to class. But sometimes these norms, okay, what you have to do is follow. Teenagers are full of these norms about you do it because everybody's supposed to do it. And if you don't, you're a weirdo, you're a wuss, you're a, I don't know what the words are around today. What are some of the other words, right? You're no good. I'll give you an example. 20 years ago, my son's in high school, and he comes home, I have to have a pair of Vans. Do they still make Vans? It's those shoes, they're like, they're made out of rubber or something, and they're black, and at that time they had black and white checks. Right, they're checked shoes, right? a piece of canvas and rubber. I go to the Foot Locker in Westwood Mall of blessed memory. I don't know, $49.99 at that time, it would be like $79.99 now. He's trying them on. I walk across, they're the exact same shoes in a Tomacan, which is like Payless, right? It was a cheap shoe chain at the time. 1999, remember we're talking about a long time ago. So he was 15, he could try on the shoes himself. He was 14, I think he was 14. I said, come here, I wanna show you something. Goes up there, and this is what happens. He looks in the window, and this is the tone. He goes, I'm not exaggerating, he goes, no! In that tone of voice. I said, what's the trouble? He said, they're not real Vans. I said, they look exactly, no, they're not the same. Vans, they used to have the little label on there, so there's a little white strip of the label, instead of being inside the shoe, was a little label that came off the end of the shoe and it said Vans on it. This one looked exactly the same, except it didn't say Vans. It said the, whatever their, their own brand was. He said, it doesn't say Vans. I said, what are people gonna do, get on the floor and read your label? They'll see during gym, they'll see something. No, it has to be real Vans, no, everybody has to wear Vans. That's the morality of their group. You think I bought them for them for two and a half times the price? Of course I do, what am I gonna do? Traumatize the kid? <laughs> it has to be this way, you have to dress this way, you have to act this way, you have to talk this way. How many people remember in high school pretending to like something that you couldn't stand? Because everybody did, what was it for you? Waffle stompers. Say it again. It was a type of shoe, it was called a waffle stomper. Yeah, you hated them, right? But you're warm anyway, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, she said. Oh, yeah. What, what, what was with you? What did you pretend to like that you hated? I don't really remember. But it was a constant, right? Yeah. I mean, how could you do it? Everybody was doing it. I saw a friend afterwards, for years afterwards. My idea was Elvis Presley. I was in middle school when Elvis Presley came. We went to a party once, and all of the girls got around and, Elvis, ah! We didn't even know who he was. The boys didn't know who he was. Years later, I found an, I, I was, I met her in Rochester. I hadn't seen, I went back to visit my father who was still living there. I hadn't seen it in a hundred, hadn't a hundred years. She calls up, we got together and I'm going through a mall 
and I saw an old Elvis album, and I gave it to her because we were friends. She said, well, thanks, but I don't like Elvis too much. I said, what? You used to stand in front of the TV screaming. She said, well, what do you want me to do, be an outcast? Everybody screamed for Elvis. Right, by the way, I like Elvis, so I never saw her again. But, right, <laughs> it, you know, it's, you knock Elvis, I'm through with you. But it, it's just, my wife's in love with him, but so I gotta be careful. But it's, you know, you have to fit in, you have to do what's right, and if you don't, there's tremendous penalty for not fitting in. Next time we'll talk about how gangs and cults and other kinds of organizations like that actually exist based upon this kind of stage three morality. Okay, see you next time.